Hello, everybody. Um, well, here we are, uh, Blade Runner 2049. Um, this is the first time we've done back-to-back -back sequels. Well, a sequel film directly after. Have we? We haven't really done any sequels yet. At least not like. I'm trying to. Um, I mean, we did well, Fantastic Beasts. We've done some of the franchises, like right, you know, Star but like Potter and stuff, but. Right, that but we didn't right, but they weren't back to back, and those are like further on uh, out. And actually, the first Fantastic Beast movie wasn't part of the movie club; it was a separate Signum thing. So, anyway, all that to say, here we are with the sequel to Blade Runner, uh, Blade Runner twenty forty nine. So let's begin, and of course, as always, we'll begin with some announcements. So this weekend, in two days, in fact, we are having a mood up in New York City. Now, um, Corey is very clear to describe that this is not an official moot, like it's not like one of our all day event conference type things. It's just sort of a little gathering. Um, it's tied around the New York City Tolkien Conference and the Morgan Library exhibit. So we knew that a lot of people were coming into town, a lot of Signumites, uh, Signumites and Mythgardians, um, which is weird to say though, because it's usually like the same people, right? Um, and uh, they're, they're going to be in town, so they are meeting up. If you're interested, um, there's the details. You can go to signumuniversity.org slash event, click on the um, event link. Um, there's also a Facebook invite, uh, or sorry, a Facebook group event, event, that's what it is, um, that I recommend joining because the people actually organizing it uh, are po posting updates there, and there is an RSVP required. So if you are going to be in New York City this weekend on Saturday evening, feel free to go to that. Meet Corey. He's going to be in town for the uh, conference and um, doing some a couple different things there. Um, and all that. We've also got, uh, speaking of moots, uh, two of our regional moots coming up. Uh, just in about a little over a week, we have Sunshine Moot down in Lakeland, Florida. Uh, not too late to register for that if you're interested in, uh, again, meeting Corey and a bunch of other uh, Signum folks down there. Uh, that is going to be a real good time. And uh, and then Nader Moot in the Netherlands next month. A uh, little more than just actually a little less than a month away um, by one day. Uh, so that should be really interesting as well. Um, it's our second European but first continental uh, moot over there. So that'll be a lot of fun. I know a lot of people are looking forward to that. Um, and then, of course, we do have registration open uh, for our big annual gathering, Myth Moot, down in Virginia. Um, the theme this year is dragons. Uh, and you can see the details there. Go to sigmuniversity.org slash mythmoot and uh, find out other details. There's lots of good stuff up there already about special guests and uh, some other stuff. Um, and then, of course, don't forget, it might only be March, but we're thinking summer, warm weather and sunshine and all of that. Uh, so our summer semester courses, they're uh, out there, ready. You can register for them. We've got one brand new course that we're running uh, this summer on the Inklings and King Arthur, um, of which you may recognize that title from a recent award-winning book published by our own Serena Higgins uh, and edited by her and, and containing lots of great essays uh, around uh, the Inklings and King Arthur in there. Um, we're also, uh, oh, I just realized I forgot to update this because the Star I Wars was class was, was not uh, one. Kat, can you remind me what should be in that place? Um, uh, we're going to run um, dystopian literature this the summer, um, which is a, also taught by Amy Sturgis. So if you're mm -hmm. a fan of hers, um, be sure to check that out. Um, Chris Swank is um, one of the preceptors oh, in the class. So if you would like to study with Chris, then there you go. Um, and yeah, we're, we're, uh, we're, we're holding off Star Wars and, you know, hoping maybe, to do something maybe because with that of something, in the near future. <laughs> yeah, happening later in the year, there might be something yeah. related to yeah. that. Um, yeah, so because we've got some Star Wars content coming out and rounding off an, another chapter in that saga. We mm. thought it might be time to, uh, think about how else we can, uh, address the wider canon. So, so come come back and hear more about that in a future uh, uh, movie club, I'm sure. Uh, yeah. Beyond Middle Earth uh, from Corey and Tom Shippey uh, for those, uh, real fun class for those who uh, enjoy 
diving deeper into the world of Tolkien and uh, and then Beowulf in Old English. That's the um, the workshop uh, for the Old English, uh, for, for the folks who have taken Old English uh, language course already. So definitely go out and sign up for some of our summer classes. And then, of course, we've got some upcoming movie clubs to talk about. Yep, yep. In, um, uh, I guess, a little over a month, we'll be talking about uh, Captive State, which is the first of our new movies that we're doing in movie club this year. Um, it's one that we don't know much about, to be honest. You know, it's it's rare. Like, a lot of times when we've done new movies, it's been because they're based on a um, book that we love or they're part of a franchise that we're invested in. And this is one that is just an original sci-fi movie. So hooray for that. Um, I mean, it's it got has, John Goodman, so. It's got John Goodman. It's got a bunch of good people in it. Um, it's by the guy who did the last few Planet of the Apes movies, mm -hmm. which were um, pretty interesting and successful. So I think there's a uh, good reason to be excited about that one. Um, and then now we have this confirmed, our date um, on May 30th, we're gonna talk about Camelot. Um, and uh, Corey Olson will be joining us, as will Chris Swank. Um, and so uh, this, if anybody's not familiar, is the 1967 adaptation of the, the stage musical. So it is a musical. I've found a legitimate way to work musicals into this program. <laughs> so don't be surprised if you've never seen it when they burst into song. Um, and it's uh, so it's the 60s one starring Richard Harris, which should be a lot of fun. And um, if people are following along with the Mythgard Academy series on the Mort Arthur, we're hoping that it kind of joins up with the end of uh, that series, um, which should be wrapping up um, in like mid to late April sometime. So uh, should be plenty of time for everybody to finish that book and uh, get ready for the movie club. Although those of you who have been to the Mythgard Academy series before, you, you understand why we put this at the end of May, just yeah. in case. Um, we need a cushion. <laughs> we, we, we know that Corey is also planning to, uh, in, in addition to Mort D'Arthur, he's, he's got a couple of other maybe movies he'll be talking about or, or adaptations that he may be talking about. And you know, there's always like a, a tack on of like other things that you need to cover and, and all those sorts of things. So we thought, late May was a good choice just to give ourselves a little buffer there. Yeah. All right, so uh, just to introduce us all, um, and I realize both Kat and I logged in as hosts, so neither of our uh, names are appearing on the screen. So hi, I'm Curtis Wyant. Um, I am a co-host with Kat of both the Movie Club and uh, podcast, uh, Kat and Kurt's TV Review. Um, I'm a digital marketer by day, but I talk about literature and film and uh, sci-fi and fantasy stuff uh, pretty much all the rest of the time. And uh, yeah, that's me. Chris, do you wanna go ahead next? Sure, I'm Chris Swank. I'm a preceptor at Mythgard, as Kat just mentioned. I'll be um, hopefully precepting the dystopian tradition class this summer. And I'm a librarian by day and a PhD student at the University of Glasgow, it's official now with Dr. Dimitri Beamy. Yay. Nice. Congrats. Dom, go ahead next. All right, I'm Dominic Nardi. I'm a political scientist by trade. I also am a science fiction and fantasy uh, geek, like, th like the rest of us here. Um, I've occasionally written, written articles about politics in Dune, Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, and other works. Um, recently, though, I've been having a bit of an identity crisis because I found this little wooden toy horse by my bed and now i don't really know who i am maybe we'll discover it in the course of this discussion um okay so i'm kat um as curtis said uh he and i run this um movie club program together for MythGuard, um and uh, i also volunteer for signum as the academic coordinator um and also do kat and kurt's tv review where we talk about uh sci-fi and fantasy tv shows um, yeah, and I wanted to remember to remind everybody to um, make sure if you have questions and comments, type them into the questions box and we'll get to as many of them as we can. Um, so to kick this off, um, Brenton Dickison, who's one of our uh, esteemed faculty and preceptors at Signum, 
uh, couldn't join us tonight, but he sent in this question, which I thought was actually a really great way to kick things off. Um, so he says, Blade Runner was a pretty interesting adaptation. Do you think when watching that film or the new one, we are supposed to carry into the theater slash TV room, TV room, I guess is the room in your house where you watch TV, um, a feeling of the motivations of the characters in the book, or do we simply take the film as it comes? Um, so I thought this might be a good icebreaker to throw out to the panelists, or if people wanna type their answers into the questions and we can read them too. Um, how do we approach this um, as a sequel? And if so, a sequel to what? Um, is this a sequel to the film? Is this a sequel to the larger story of which the film is an adaptation? Are, you know, potentially are we looking at uh, a continuation of the story as presented in a novel? Um, all of the above, none of the above, what do we think? How do we kind of go into the theater watching this movie? Um, so I was thinking a bit about this question and at the risk of generalizing and overgeneralizing and throwing a few hot takes out there, um, <laughs> I actually think for a lot of science fiction adaptations, the characters aren't really the draw. You know, like, the, the appeal of a lot of, especially hard science, science fiction, hard science fiction literature is often in, in the ideas, sometimes in the technology. Um, and in Philip K. Dick's works, it's, it's often philosophical ideas about identity or humanity. But, you know, there, there has been some criticism of Dick's works and other older science fiction for the characterization. The characters are tend to be a bit more wooden. The dialogue isn't as rich. And I, I think that's just partly a function of the fact that these are these are works, these are idea works, you know, these are, there's some big idea that they're trying to get at. So I just, I don't, I don't think the character is the focus of the story. And we talked about the making of Blade Runner last time, so I won't reiterate that, but it's, it's quite clear that the, the writers and Ridley Scott, when he's directing the film, did not study the characters in the book very closely. Um, you know, it seems my understanding of the process, not that we have to be, you know, dictated by what they did, but yeah, they basically took the idea of the book and said, hey, there's an interesting idea. Let's run with it. Um, so I, I I think at least in this case, um, Blade Runner is in a philosophical discourse with the novel, but the characters are their own. I'm, I'm a big Tabula Rasa fan for uh, for movies. I think you need to go in even though there was a book, I think you just need to go in with that blank slate and take the movie for what it is. So um, like most people um, who probably saw this movie in the 80s, we didn't even really know it was a book. Before then it had a different title than the book and um, Philip K. Dick, um, I, I don't know if he was huge in the 80s. I was you know, high school kid, so um, I hadn't heard of him. So I just kind of took it as what it was, just the movie. So I would say, though, I can I could possibly think of cases where we're supposed to take perhaps some ideas or characterizations from the ad adaptation. I think perhaps Lord of the Rings, Game of Thrones, I could see a case being made for thinking of the adaptation as a visual representation and then the novel as filling in the blanks or uh, letting us in inside the character's heads. Um, Whereas I just, I don't think the Blade Runner films work like that. Deckard in the book is a very different character. Mm -hmm. And so I just, but I could see it with, I could see this with other other works. Yeah. And I, I was actually thinking of Lord of the Rings too, um, when you were talking first, Dom, because I mean, just think of even like Aragorn, like the, the motivations and characterization of his, like, you know, in the film, like, you know, do I, do I, you know, show myself as the king or not, and sort of like there, there's a very different, you know, uh, aspect to kind of his, you know, do I or don't I reveal my, you know, lineage? You know, that's not really part of the book. Like, there's a completely different motive for him, in particular. I mean, I'm, sh 
I'm sure there are plenty of people at Mythgard who could find other examples of that specific to Lord of the Rings, but yeah. Um, David Atlee in the chat is saying that in general, he thinks you know people should take an adaptation, uh, whatever the medium, whether it's, uh, you know, I guess a movie like this or comic book or whatever, you know, that should be taken on its own terms. So um, kind, of, kind of agreeing with you, Chris, I think on the tabula rasa idea. Um, and I mean, I, I think I'm pretty much there as well in my own thoughts, just thinking specifically from do Android stream. I mean, there's so many elements that affect character motivation in there, um, even not specific to characters, but just thinking of like, the, the whole concept of mercerism or, you know, the machine where you can dial your feelings, where there's like even, it, it's so attuned to like very specific, like there are feelings that give you motivation to feel other feelings or even, isn't there even like a meta one, like like you dial to make you want to dial, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, so how do you how do you take something like that and and say like, well, that's, such a motivating factor in the book, you know, how you feel and that feeling prompting you to want to do certain things. And then, you know, in a movie where that doesn't even exist, like you, I don't see how you could even have, you know, that same character motivation, you know, coming over. Yeah, it could be convinced though, maybe that um, we, I don't, I don't remember to say that we're supposed to because as, as Chris said, most people probably had, had not read the book before seeing the movie. Yeah. But I think there's a case to be made that reading the book, understanding the world building can help inform your viewing of the movie, especially oh, sure. with sure. things like uh, the animals. In the, in the book, animals mm -hmm. are very important. There's this whole subplot about how Deckard wants to buy sheep. The movie has a, has a few scenes with animals. And if you watch the movie with the context of the book, you don't make anything of it. But then you know, knowing how rare animals are, you know, knowing how important they are to Deckard, uh, you know, seeing, seeing even like the animal row and seeing the ostrich, or even in Blade Runner 2049, there's a scene later in the movie where Kay sees a, an apiary with bees. Mm -hmm. And as we know from the real world, world bees are in danger. So, you know, just, so having all that context from the book makes those scenes read very differently. And I think in, in some interesting ways. That's a really good example of, of that specific kind of detail because um, I did definitely, even having seen the movie first, completely glossed over the whole animal, electric animal sub, subplot, having seen the movie. Mm -hmm. um, and even knowing the title of the book, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, I never imagined that that would be a literal plot point that like, oh, there's actually electric animals. I, I kind of assumed going into the reading weird, of the book okay, that title. <laughs> i thought like well that's like yeah like robot jokes like humans dream of sheep and so robots dream of electric sheep that makes sense he's he's <laughs> you know making a making a joke about that um and was completely surprised to find that this is like a central thematic and emotional concern of of the book so um for sure, like rewatching the first Blade Runner and then going on to this one, um, which I think I saw both of them before I ever read the book. So in neither of oh, really? them did I really fully understand the significance of that. Um, and I don't think it necessarily hurts the films to not know that. I mean, I think it's an interesting bit of um, mise-en-scene that's just there in the background that maybe it, it's giving you something even if you don't consciously realize um, what it's adding to the world. You just sort of buy it as part of the texture of the background. But when you do go back and read it, you have this whole greater understanding of what it's really getting at and what the significance is. I think that's what's interesting about 2049 added to the first two is that you've now had 30 years to read the book. <laughs> and so maybe a lot more people have read the book. They've certainly seen the first movie. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is much more of a conversation that comes up between those three versus versus the first movie with the book. I think you get um, a lot more awareness of the animals, like when um, when they're in Vegas and Kay says, you know, is that dog real? You yeah. know, and Deckard is just like, yeah, I don't know, ask him. Ask him, um, yeah. Right, that, that, and the whole point about um, the, in the original movie, the owl, and then they even replay that clip um, mm -hmm. do you like our owl? 
Is he real? Of course not. So I, I think this movie that we're talking about tonight is definitely uh, carrying more baggage than the first movie. Um, so kind of along, along the same lines of sequels to the book versus the movie or, um, or maybe even sequel isn't the right term, but like in the tradition of the book versus in the tradition of the movie or where you're drawing sources from, however you want to look at it. Um, I thought in what, this is the first time I had seen 2049. I didn't see it in the theater when it came out. Um. So I watched it. There's a reason it bombed at the box office, Curtis. <laughs> You're part I, of the problem. Um, yeah, I could have given it the extra 200 million that it needed to be successful. Uh, the um, <laughs> so in in watching this though, I felt like there were some aspects, at least visually or tonally, or um, can't use. Uh, I'm gonna pronounce it wrong. Mise en scene, is that how you say it? Uh, Mise en scene. To, there you go. Um, that I felt actually did a better job of capturing how I felt when I was reading the book um, than the original movie did, um, which isn't even necessarily like a complaint against the original movie because if we're taking it from a tabula rasa perspective, like it works fine. But I, I always felt when I had seen the movie, well, I, I saw the movie, I saw the original movie first, years later read the book and then saw the original movie again and so kind of had that context. But I remember when I went back and, and revisited the movie after reading the book, feeling like, like, wow, this world seems way more crowded than the book felt to me. Um, and now, um, in addition to watching like the the interstitial, there's like three like, period pieces kind of like leading up to 2049, right? That I'm glad Dom told us to watch before we talked about this. Cause it, it does give you that sort of background of like war and, you know, um, there's kind of a depopulation and, and fights and revolutions going on and stuff that makes some of the scenes and visual elements here just a lot closer to what I feel like is the book world um, just with things like you know Deckard living way out in the middle of nowhere in these empty buildings where it's not it's not like he's living out you know I, I was thinking about it because I was trying to fit in my cabin scenario and it just doesn't work because it's not really a cabin scenario but but I think we can look at it as like you know Vegas and like there was this whole populated area, but now the world is so depopulated that it's, he kind of like lives there and like the world has just pulled away from that area now. So he's just kind of like there in this little area that's not really a wilderness per se. It's just that the world has shrunk back and that gives a lot more uh, of a feel to um, what's the chicken head's name in the book there. <laughs> I'm, I'm blanking uh, for the moment uh, there. Is the door? Uh, it's, yeah, it's a door. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you know, yeah. that feel of him kind of living alone, uh, you know, in this like apartment complex that used to be full and, you know, um, now it's full of just all the kibble and, and, or whatever the right word is, kibble. Kibble, I think it is, right? Um, not kibble. Kibble's what dogs eat. Um, and, uh, you know, just that idea of like, like, there used to be life and there used to be society and there used to be all of this, but now it's pulled away and retracted. I felt that this movie did a lot better of that type of thing um, than the original one did, which the, you know, again, the original one still felt more like it's a bear. It, it's not only a populated world, it's like an overpopulated world. And now this mm -hmm. one's like, no, there's maybe pockets of population and even overpopulation in some areas, but like the rest of the world is like vast and, you know, has like radioactive waste and you know there's people who can't leave because of you know the immune system effects of war and that kind of thing um that i feel like the book had and the first movie didn't really portray as much and so, it's an interesting way of kind of splitting the difference and i mean normally that backfires like right when you try to satisfy everybody you end up satisfying nobody but i think that this movie um does an interesting job of 
paying homage to both of its source materials in a way that feels interesting and satisfying that like, you know, I, I think it totally makes sense for the first Blade Runner that in terms of keeping the geography fairly contained, they kind of take the underpopulated, you know, Isidore section and they just move him into the city. So he still lives in this big mm -hmm. empty building. It's just in the middle of the overcrowded, um, yeah. you know, LA area, You rather than, but then what they do in this in this movie, which is interesting, is you get the classic Blade Runner scenes of flying through the you know skyscraper noir esque L.A. Um, but then you also get that kind of sense from the book of venturing out into the kind of desolate wasteland outside of the cities, and you get you know, uh, and, and I think actually like. Think, having seen Corey talk talk about um, the way that uh, Tolkien's works work with like typology and things like that, where there's mm -hmm. things in the Silmarillion um, and Lord of the Rings that echo each other, and there's kind of types of characters that that prefigure each other, or you know themes and images that kind of repeat over time. And I feel like that's maybe kind of what they're playing with here, like even these these two, sh the images we have on the slide here, where you have Deckard in the same pose over again, or you have Kay as a new kind of Deckard. Um, and then you have De Deckard living as the Isidore character lived. So you kind of have them, you know, characters repeating the same behavior or the same ideas, either as their old selves or as somebody completely different. Um, and it just makes for a really kind of interesting viewing experience when you or, know all these references. Or Rachel as Rachel. <laughs> or Rachel as Rachel. Well, well or yeah. as uh, Mariette as Pris. It's kind of Pris-like, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Down to the hair and everything. Um, right. Curtis briefly mentioned that there's three prologue shorts. They're only six to 10 minutes. And they're um, on the disc as a special feature. You can also find them on YouTube. And it's a uh, 2022 blackout. 2036, Nexus Dawn, and 2048, Nowhere to Run. And they kind of fill in some of that uh, in-between time. Um, and when they're talking about the EMP, the electromagnetic pulse that happened, there's one of those that's about that. So I found those really very satisfying. You know, I'll be honest. Um, I initially was a bit worried because I saw some of these parallels that you all pointed out. And I was a bit worried this film was going in the direction of fan service. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I'd seen Force Awakens two years earlier, and I knew that there was very much a risk of a franchise film basically repeating what the earlier version had done. And I think what's interesting about Blade Runner 2049, though, is that it, it, it has some of those parallels, but I think to a much more deliberate effect. And as I watch it and rewatch it, I'm actually more struck by the differences. Um, mm -hmm. Some of the differences that Curtis pointed out, but also, um, you know, because the, the film sets you up for a chosen one story, so it seems like it's playing into that fan service. It seems like, oh, our main character, Kay, he's the son of Deckard and Rachel, who are characters from the first movie. Ooh, isn't that cool? And then at the end, it's it's it, it's a bit of a switch and says, you know, no, he's he's not. You don't have to be, you know, you don't have to play into that, those typologies. You don't have to play into that fan service to be special, like for, for his story to be meaningful. Kay can be a meaningful character without those parallels. Mm -hmm. um, I just, you know, so my, my initial worries about the film, I actually thought were brilliantly under, sub, uh, subverted at the end. I think they do that on purpose, you know, um, Pris is, is Definitely. a killer and Mariette is a savior kind of figure. I mean, she, she's definitely out to help him. And um, Roy Batty is this big hulking guy who can take you apart. And so is Sapper Morton, but Sapper Morton is like this healer. He, he um, was a medic during the wars. And um, so you have these types, but in 2049, they're subverted really intentionally to kind of do this, Philip K. Dick thing, which is he's always pulling the rug out from under you. And this is what uh, what uh, Denis Villeneuve did here, I think, was a lot of rug pulling. Right, and it's kind of repetition with, with a difference, right? Like you get 
those reminders, but then they go in directions you don't expect. So with Sapper Morton, you get the kind of, there's, you know, certain things like even just punching him through the wall, like that just feels familiar from the end of Blade Runner. But it's like, okay, the thing that you think of as the climax of the last movie, we're gonna get that over in the first 10 minutes of this movie and then do something else. So there are those parallels, but as you guys are saying, they're, they're there to, um, kind of remind you of the original and then subvert it and and make you think you know what's coming and maybe take it in a different direction well and and then like even with that specific example then you get like him running through the wall later right which is like yeah it's not just like you know getting thrown through a wall but it's like self-propelled you know through a wall um yeah which, and i think I it's more it's kind of I mean, we can get more into K deeper later too, but I think it's not just subversion for the sake of it too, that like, yeah, yeah. as as Don's saying with, you, you know, he doesn't have to be the chosen one to be our protagonist and our hero, but yeah. it's not because he's not the chosen one that makes him the protagonist either. It's because of, despite being that chosen one, he does what he considers to be the right thing anyway, and is, self-sacrificial and you know goes for he goes to die for what he what he thinks is the right cause um so it's not just a matter of like oh ho ho gotcha you thought he was special and he's not but then it's it's a question of what does he do once he finds out that he's not the kind of messiah of this world I just remembered we've been talking about visuals a lot and we have a slide on visuals. Um, I'm right. not so that familiar I'm, with altered carbon. So someone else will have to sort of talk through this maybe. I mean, and there. we don't we don't even have to get into it, but um if you you know Google that that YouTube video, um Blade Runner Altered Carbon and the relevancy of cyberpunk, um, that takes you to this YouTube video which Dom shared, um, which kind of shows Blade Runner as the forefather of the visual design of all cyberpunk since for the most part. Um, and, you know, without even getting into altered carbon, it looks very much like a carbon copy of Blade Runner. It's clear to say the nothing original of Blade Runner to clarify. The original. Yeah. And, and that's not to say anything about the story or the content, but just visually, like it's very clear that this is, you know, set in the same world almost. Um, and, you know, the the one joke of the video being, um, which I think I mentioned in the last uh, uh, discussion we did, is that Altered Carbon looks more like the sequel to Blade Runner than the actual sequel to Blade Runner. So now here we've seen the actual sequel. Um, and here's some kind of visual examples of how it doesn't at times look anything like um, the original. And sometimes it does, for sure. There's definitely times where they lean into the world as you expect it to look. Um, but then you get these examples of these kind of very like fantastical, um, mm -hmm. you know, brightly colored, monochromatic, you know, nothing, um, very little that's kind of noir-esque about these. Um, and it's very surprising, I think, given the visual impact of Blade Runner and what you expect. And so again, I think it's like when they expect you to zig, that's when, you know, Villeneuve is gonna zag the other direction. It's I a lot more dystopic, sorry. I think Villeneuve did two really interesting things to the world building here to build off what Kat said. First, um, he did something different from the original Blade Runner, which, you know, the, the, as this, the Blade Runner has a huge influence on how science fiction movies look. So just the fact that he and his design team were able to break out of that mold um, a lot of kudos to them. But second, um, and we might talk a bit more about this later. You know, so the year right now, when we're doing this podcast, is 2019, and the original Blade Runner was supposed to be set in 2019. Yeah. So we don't have replicants, just people in the future. We don't have this level of technology. We don't have the world hasn't gone to hell like in the, the original Blade Runner. Like things are different. But what Bill Niv did is he said, okay, instead of trying to um, make 2049 look like a pro projection of our future with iPads and you know cell phones and everything. 
he said, okay, well, I'm going to project 30 years into the future from uh, the original Blade Runner 2049. And so that meant, that meant a few things. It meant things like, you know, well, maybe, maybe Atari hadn't collapsed in the eighties um, and the Atari is still around, or maybe the Soviet Union is still around. Maybe they still have a lot of analog technology and a lot of flip switches on their computers. And, um, but it also, it also, this, the, the, the film doesn't really touch upon climate change directly, but it's there, I think, implicitly throughout this film. Climate change and other environment related environmental disasters, just looking at even at these images, um, this is a world under a lot of environmental stress. And that's, again, part of the projection of the future. And that's one of the reasons why this is, and this, this, the, the video Kat mentioned brings this up, you know, this is a, unlike Altered Carbon, unlike a lot of other labor and or copycats, this is a world in which uh, environmental change is a real and pressing issue. There's this, this big wall you can see in the city of Los Angeles in the film, keeping back the, the flooding waters. And I don't think any of the characters have already mentioned why the wall is there, but like, that's, that's the con, that's, that's the con, that's kind of the context of the film and the environment and what these characters are living. So, um, you know, so yeah, so it just, it looks very different from the first film and it's, a, it's in a different world from the first film, which again, just kudos to the filmmakers to be able to take that leap and, you know, unshackle themselves from what Ridley Scott did. Right. And kudos to, um, the cinematographer, Roger Deakins, who finally, yes, yes. after 14 yes. nominations, um, was given a very well-deserved Oscar for this movie. So, um, uh, yeah, it's really striking to look at. So, like, I mean, other than maybe making it visually distinctive and, and you know, some of the environmental concerns, like, what do you think is the effect of these kinds of color palettes, because it's not what you expect in terms of, um, maybe Chris, you were starting to say something about dystopia. Like, I don't look at, I don't look at these images and think um, dystopia necessarily with um, the brightness and the kind of beauty of the images. Um, I mean, you kind of have the dead tree there in, in the one, which is a bit ominous, but um, I don't know. What do you think we kind of take away from some of these like bright, splashy neon sort of color palettes here. I think the monochromaticness really emphasizes how empty the world is. So mm -hmm. in the first movie, like Curtis was saying, it looks like a very crowded LA and in the book, you know, it's supposed to be a, a more depopulated world. 30 years on, it's even more depopulated. Here's this one dead tree out in the middle of, you know, just this white kind of wasteland. Then you go to Vegas where it's sort of sand orange color. And I think that monochromaticness just really emphasizes how empty and there's not a lot of signage, you know, away from LA. There's not uh, anything else capturing your attention but that one color. One of my favorite scenes in the movie is when they fly out to um, San Diego, which has become the garbage dump of LA. Right. And it's like the whole city of San Diego yeah. is now the garbage dump for LA and and uh, really kind of that for me was one of the most dystopic moments. Yeah and even I mean you get the image with the the pastels and the hologram there you know the the big one on the right and it's like like there's nobody else on this walkway slash bridge that he's mm -hmm. on like even even that, I mean, you get some of the lights in the background that imply that there's, you know, people in buildings and stuff, but it's like, it's far away. There's, there's a, it, it's not the crowded, like, yeah, streets of LA, like you get in, in the first one. I mean, we do get some of that here. I don't want to make it sound like there are no other people anywhere. There are certainly scenes where we see, you know, a lot more people around and, and that kind of thing. But um, yeah, I like, like this whole, I, I agree, Chris, that like this, a lot of the scenes in the movie emphasize the emptiness and, and, and I would, I would say that, that pulling back kind of a society, you know, away from like the structures that it's built, like this, you know, giant hologram advertisement of a, you know, naked woman plying her trade or whatever, like there's nobody around except like you get the sense that like Deckard's like the first one 
you know, to like stumble by to be advertised to in a while. Um, well, Curtis, it's not just a naked woman flying her tray, though. This is it's a joy. You know, it's a joy hologram model that Kay had. Fair in enough. I, I, but that's that's important, though, because I think, well, there's like, the whole idea of an industry set up to have hologram companions in your home, I think, really speaks to the sense of loneliness. Like this is this is a sure. world in which your 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 only companion might be this artificial intelligence that you can't even touch. Sure, and I mean, I think you could make an argument that that itself is. I mean, that's coming both from the book and the first movie too, right? Like, I mean, the first movie didn't have the holograms per se, but I mean, there were the replicants that, you know provided some of that and then you know now we've got these yeah the the hologram joys to you know kind of help with that um yeah i mean it kind of does what don was saying about like imagines the world of you know blade runner 2019 and extrapolates it forward 30 years of you could kind of see the joy technology as an evolution of the whatever the AI is that runs the replicants too. Um, right. You know, they're not the same. Yeah, I mean, I assume that it was. Like, right. it, like it's right. just like a branch of this or a different application of the same type of right. technology. Right. Without, I mean, it's just kind of occurring to me now, without the kind of physical threat that replicants can sometimes represent, right? Like Joy um, gives you the companionship and the sense of interaction and with the little mechanical things in his apartment, you know, she can do certain things, um, but she's not gonna lead a rebellion and wage a civil war against you because she's not physical, you know? So I can kind of see there's a logic there. Of well, that's the next how do we, movie. How do we, right, how do we, well, yes. And maybe she, figures out a way to have her own revolution. But um, I, I, I see a logical link there of like, how do we, as you know, corporations keep what we liked about the replicant models and take away all the things that ended up being dangerous and make that more appealing for people? But it's one of the things that's dangerous, independent thought and personality because and there's a there's a very big debate about joy in the Blade Runner fan community. So it, this is not a subtle question, but joy it seems to me very much following a program that makes her look appear to be not programmed. Um, in the scene that's pictured in the slide, where she's the, the hologram is pointing to him and saying that he's a good Joe, that is reminding Kay that his joy gave him a name. The name Joe, and at the time he he thought, oh, this is a moment. This is a moment in which he's bonding with his joy. That the, they were really developing a deep relationship. And it turns out, no, like the, the the joy models are just programmed to call their their male companions Joe. Um, so the, the the joy, you know, and Anna de Armas, the actress, does a great job with the character, but she's. Unlike the replicants in the first film, who had a lot of personality and individuality and spunk, Joy seems very much like a mass-produced item, which in some ways kind of makes this future in 2049 even more lonely. It's like having Siri as your best friend. Yeah, um, and as you were talking, I was reminded of there's like... Um in that first scene where we see her, where she's like serving dinner and she's like, you know, whatever, like the 1950s housewife. Yeah, housewife. And, but then like, there's that little like, oh, did you know that this song was released <laughs> in my reprise records, whatever year or whatever? And it's like, like, I remember the first time I saw that, I'm like- The product yeah. placements. To totally, yeah, like, well, product placement are not like totally a programmed in fact, you know, which kind of works because it's like that idea of like being the perfect hostess, right? You always have to have like an interesting fact or, you know, you want to keep the conversation going kind of idea in that persona, right? You know, how to be the perfect 1950s housewife hostess kind of thing. Um, but then totally 
it's like, yeah, something that like a AI script writer would write into the program, right? Like, oh, here's an interesting fact, <laughs> you know, um, I don't know, it just reminded me of that when you were talking, but yeah, I, I, I agree. Like there, I think it's well done. Cause I think, I mean, I, I, like that's, I think that's intentional, like it, as part of the act and part of the movie script to like come across as like, yes, I'm this in, independent AI that can do this thing, but like there's maybe a slight awkwardness or a slight, uh, it, it's not visually the idea of the uncanny value, but sort of like, or uh, uncanny valley, I mean, um, but it's that same idea of like, there's just something just not quite perfect about the humanness of the AI that kind of triggers a little cringe or, you know, something that shows you that it's off. So um, David Atley in the chat is pushing back against this. And I definitely want to ask this too. Like, it sounds like from what you guys are saying, at least that um, you're seeing her even at the end as fully programmed. Like, you know, her, th this scene of the hologram advertisement and the kind of gut punch of hearing her call him Joe is sort of confirmation that she was programmed all along. Um, but, you know, David's questioning whether or not that's true. Like there's times where she really does see to, seem to be alive and requests to go with him and, um, you know, asks him to kind of take her along even though it's dangerous and you know kind of sacrifices herself in the end um what do you think like is is that a, is this an ambiguous question are we supposed to be questioning whether or not this joy is different from the other joys or do you think it's a closed um case by the end of the movie i think we're supposed to question it i think we're never supposed to know in the same way that we never knew about rachel in the first movie, did Rachel really love Deckard or was she just trying to survive? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, I think we're in the same, we're in the same territory, but the script writer uh, or the screenwriter, Hampton Fancher, is that how you pronounce his name? I think yes. so, yeah. He, he did a interview on the special features of the DVD and he's fully of the opinion that, that this, not this joy on the screen, but um, Kay's joy uh, does actually fall in love with him and, and has independent emotions. But the intention I, of the writer versus yeah. the sure. right. interpretation right. of the viewer. Yes. Like I absolutely agree with the sentiment that we are supposed to talk about this, and we will. You know, I've listened to other podcasts, like um, Blade Runner podcast, where they had two-hour episodes dedicated just to joy, and I think more two-hour episodes dedicated just to joy. <laughs> uh, this is going to be, you know, I think this is going to be like the. Um, is Deckard a replicant question for mm -hmm. our generation. And I think my statement about Joy just earlier came from my latest viewing of the, of the film. I, when I first saw the film, I actually saw her as having more free will. Um, but then it gets to that question, what is free will? Do any of us have free will? Well, even, if she, even if Joy fell in love with Kay, how much of that was determined by the mix of the combination of her programming and experiences? Yeah. And so any AI is programmed like there's that's not a question to be to begin with like that's there's a programming there you know does learning over time make the programming better yes that's what you know artificial intelligence is is that it gets better over time you know and and it's not that like the programming goes away it's just that there's different inputs and reactions and more data that the programming has to run against so that programming is never going to go away you know, in t like there's many different roads we could go down, you know, in terms of free will or not. Um, yeah, do humans have free will? How much are we run by our own programming of genetic code and that kind of thing? There's that. There's also, you know, the idea of, you know, emergent consciousness and um, what level of, to what extent do we have a sort of, you know, free will that comes out of that emergence and that sort of thing. I mean, um, there are many different roads you can go down. And and I think it applies to both humans and, you know, AI in the films, whether it's replicants or, you know, joy or who, you know, 
the animals even to some extent, right? Like, yeah, um, I think it's all all stuff we can definitely think about. I don't think that saying that it's programming necessarily denies the fact that there could be some kind of free will that works out in there or that over time that there's an evolution of some kind um, that happens. Mm -hmm. My uh, iPhone is so good now that it, you know, knows all my particular typos that I make time and time again. And when it's suggesting a word, it even now suggests those typos. Is this what you meant to type? <laughs> so even something like an iPhone can can grow and learn over time and then do something quirky based on, on who they're around. So the iPhones probably take over the world. Sure. Sure, but I think what um, you know the replicants kind of struggle with in these movies is what what is the difference if there is one um, between their ultra sophisticated lifelike programming and life or a soul um, as you know kind of Kay puts it um, in this uh, in this movie so um, yeah, and maybe that's an unanswerable question about joy and, and it's probably designed to be unanswerable and to keep us sort of speculating and uh, arguing back and forth. And as Dom said, changing our opinion, you know, from one viewing to the next, you might feel differently about um, her motivation or uh, her evolution in the end. Um, but she's a simpler thing in some ways than, like even if she kind of does evolve to some sort of independent will or thought. Um, I don't think there's necessarily, um, you know, she's not necessarily wrestling with the same question of K that Kay is in this movie of, was I a creature born? Was I something, you know, that I have a soul because I was born and not made? So in that way, he's this kind of halfway step between, you know, the AIs on the one side, you know, and the genuine human life on the other side. Yeah, this actually might be a good transition to the next slide because that's where we're talking about identity and the replicants, um, which is a question I've been fascinated with in these movies. Um, in, in, in this film, Kay um, tells Lieutenant Joshi that Lieutenant Joshi says that he's been doing pretty well for a replicant. And he says, well, you know, basically uh, to be born is to have a soul like he, he, his, he is you know, his self-worth near the beginning of the film seems to be determined by his status as a replicant um, as opposed to the rest of human society, which was born. That seems to be a, a, a stark dividing line for him. And this film, I think in a lot of ways, more so than the first, really hits at that, that sense that the replicants are, are this other, that they're discriminated against. Um, there are a lot of um, cases in which humans um, uh, shout uh, what we think of as like racial epithets mm -hmm. at uh, the replicants, like skin job, or I think Skinner was another one. Mm -hmm. um, uh, when when K going to his apartment, you know, people are shouting at him, and somebody wrote like I think Skinner on his door. So this is you know, this is a world in which although although replicants are legal, they're no longer hunted to at least the case model is not hunted to death the way that Roy Batty was. He is still told that he is the outsider. And I think in a lot of ways, the movie 2049 is his journey to finding a sense of identity and a sense of self self worth that is different from that. And that, 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 that doesn't, that not just changes his status, but that does not rely on his status as a replicant. Um, yeah, there's a um, couple things that jump to mind. The, the, the way that he kind of averts his eyes, like when he's walking that scene early on when he's walking through, you know, LAPD, of course, and they're, uh, you know, kind of getting, getting up in his face and shouting things at him and, and just the very deferential kind of body language there. Of he's just learned to not make eye contact and just get through it and accept that as kind of part of his place in the world. 
Um, and then I also wanted to bring up to get your thoughts on um, the the baseline test um, as kind of a, this new version of what was it the VK the Voigt Kampf um, mm -hmm. test and and the ways in which it's similar and different. Um, because that's really, and I feel like I've had to see the movie like three times now before I'm starting to maybe understand how it works. It's a very like surreal kind of thing, but even that, uh, what used to be this kind of empathy test of we're gonna like shine a light in your eye and ask questions about, um, I don't know, animal, like using the skins of bears and things like that and, and test, read to see how you know, sad or, you know, disturbed you are by that idea. And that's how we measure your humanity. Now I feel like it's this assault of kind of like dehumanizing language, like, and you're expected to repeat certain words, I imagine, without any emotion or hesitation. And while they're kind of saying like, you know, do they, when they're, when you're not on duty, do they keep you in a box? And what, like all these like really like aggressive kind of things that are part of the test. So anyway, I found that being very striking. So I didn't yeah. know if anybody had any other thoughts about the baseline test and kind of how it works. I, I took it based on the, I think it was the third prologue um, where he kind of, or I, I don't remember which one. I think I thought it was the third one where he, you know, you, um, they're describing these new models, right, of of Nexus that like have to obey and, you know, and then he kills himself or whatever. Um, and uh, I took it as that, that like the command at the end to like say the word three times or whatever, mm -hmm. like that, like that's the, maybe not the only part of the test that matters, but that's like the significant part of like, you know, if you, if for some reason they don't do that and don't do it immediately, like then there's some failure with the obey, obey, obeying uh, portion of their code. Um, but it, it does bring up a good question. Cause like, I, I hadn't really thought about it in comparison to the old test, which as you noted is a test of empathy. This isn't, it's a, it's a test of obedience. And that's the right word, obedience. That's the noun I was looking for. Um, and so, so there's kind of two ways you could take that, right? Does does that mean that like the Nexus AI or you know any AI at this point still has a problem with empathy, and so it's like, well, we're just not going to test for that anymore? Or does that mean no? It's actually gotten really good, and now they do have empathy and so it's no longer a adequate way of measuring you know whether that you know right like maybe they feel they, is, is, uh, maybe they feel they've kind of covered that hurdle and we're on to the next step so maybe it's no longer a question do replicants feel things right. um because we saw plenty of evidence of that in the last movie so that's 30 years ago historically but now it's a question yeah. of we don't really care anymore about whether or not they feel. Now the question is, well, and we have them identified. So maybe it's less a problem of weeding them out and you know finding them. Now it's a question of how do we control them and how do we keep them obedient and subservient and accepting of their place in the world? I took the test as um, basically pushing the replicants almost to the point of exhaustion to explore their and any possible latent desire for human or emotional connection. Because a lot of the questions deal with um, either being isolated or connected to other people. There's the question about, have you ever been isolated in a cell or something like that? And the, the, one of the responses is interlinked, which is you know about linking up with different people or communities mm -hmm. uh, in cells implies isolation, being apart. Um, there's a, if, if, if anybody really wants to dig into this, there's an interesting article uh, in the book, uh, a book called Cyberpunk Nexus, just on the baseline test. And apparently the, the, the poem portion at the beginning of the baseline test and some of the lines are drawn from Vladimir Nab Nabokov's Pale Fire, which is the book 
that Kay has, has in the a, book. Fantastic. Yeah, he has in the apartment. And Joyce says, oh, this is your favorite book. And I mean, I don't know if I've even worked out the significance of that. I have not read Pale Fire, so I'm, I'm mm-hmm. sure I'm missing a lot of lot from that context. But it just seems so interesting that, you know, they took that his favorite book is the book. It's, it, it, I guess it, it would be like if for, for, for one of us, you know, our, you know, ever after you know, during work, we are all tested on Lord of the Rings as a way to see if our memory is intact and if our, I check our emotional stability. But mm-hmm. uh, yeah, so I don't know. I don't have any, I don't have any answers to the baseline test, but it just, it's, it is a fascinating uh, part of the film. Well, and that kind of further gives confirmation to um, what, David saying in the chat that um, it seems that the baseline test is uh, personalized. That so, yeah, yeah, which hadn't occurred to me, not knowing that those quotes were from Pale Fire. Um, that they're deliberately throwing quotes at him um, and sn- significant words from his favorite book. So that definitely suggests that everybody gets a different baseline test, um, and they're, you know, personalizing it to you know get a particular emotional response from the subject um and which which that's in the movie there's definitely the line about you like you're way off your baseline like you don't look like yourself so there's this idea that we know whatever your psychological makeup is we know what you look like when you're at your normal calm level um so i think that's hinted at but this definitely gives that makes that a much more confirmed theory, I think. And when he gets off his baseline is when he starts to lie and disobey and right. hide things. So it's actually a really accurate test. Mm-hmm. Lie and disobey, but also... Uh, question. <laughs> also question, yes. Right. Also start to believe that he is part of a family, that he has a father... I don't think he knows his, his potential mother, Rachel, was dead at that. Oh, yeah, she was dead. But I don't, you know, I don't think he identified. Like, he, he was, I guess, he was, he was starting to believe in the possibility that he would have, he would have a real connection with another person. And mm. this is also, it's also in the same time that Joy starts acting less like the stereotypical 1950s housewife and more like possibly a unique individual who is going above and beyond the program again, separate debates, separate for a different time. But um, so, yeah, I think it's just interesting that the test detects that. And you know, it's like, you know, he's showing too much personality. Mm. Right. And there's, you know, the many layers of, you know, maybe the baseline text uh, test is picking up on the lying and the disobedience, but I think those aren't the issue that those are, the things he does because he's questioning, like, like kind of as you're saying, like it's it's the questioning that leads to the lying and the disobedience. It's not as though he um, just you know wakes up one morning and and his programming is off. It, it's that that wrestling with his identity that engenders these different behaviors. Well, if you don't have any familial relationships, if you don't have ties to other people. You know, what do you care? Like, why? What? What incentive do you have to lie? Like, a lot of, you know, a lot of our lying and cheating in life. Now look at the the uh, the big college academic scandal that came out recently. Why are people doing that? Because they had loved ones that they wanted you know, they they wanted to cheat to advance their children's interest. Um, a lot of times we lie, cheat, steal, commit crimes because we have emotional connections, not not despite our emotions. Mm-hmm. And in a way, I kind of wonder if the test is pushing at that and that and on that saying all right you know make trying to make sure it's that all the little replicants in the department are just isolated and just just workaholics basically right and until he gets this potential revelation about his origin what cause does he have to ever question that he's anything other than what he's always been told um so that makes total sense. Um, yeah, I think the thing I switch slides here just because I feel like we've moved into talking specifically about K now. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Kat. No, just that I know a topic we wanted to talk about is um, for me, 
having seen this before, but completely forgot how quick we how quickly we find out that he is a replicant and yeah. what a shocking moment that is and how that like that's not at all i expected um and maybe this is dumb and that's why they didn't do it but i expected to come in <laughs> with another protagonist who you spend the whole movie wondering is he or isn't he and then just the fact that they come right out and say it um is very surprising Pretty and quick, another yeah. kind of zag in a different direction so i don't know if anybody else was smarter than me but um i found that a pleasant surprise I, I wasn't smarter than you. Um, I, well, so I, I actually knew I had read somewhere that in some, I think when I was maybe writing the, you know, page for the movie club here, like I had, I had seen that K was a replicant. So like, I kind of had that spoiled for me going into it, but I mean, but it's not much of a spoiler as you know, cause like you find that out pretty quickly and and I was surprised by that too, because like, although I had learned that he was a replicant, I didn't know where that was revealed. And I was totally expecting it to be revealed in like a late scene of the movie. And when it's like, I don't know, 15 minutes in or 10 minutes in or something, and you're like, oh, okay, we know this already. So I guess we're good from here on out. I don't know anything. So mm -hmm. um I, I did know that Harrison Ford came back as well. So I was waiting to see him too. But, um, I, you know, anyway, I, I was definitely surprised by the timing of the revelation within the movie, even though I knew it going in uh, into the film. I think this is another rug pulling that, that uh, Villeneuve does. Um, Ridley Scott said in the director's um, uh, commentary in the first movie that you know, you're you're wondering if Deckard is a replicant or not, and wouldn't that be really messed up to have this guy who's a replicant and doesn't know he's a replicant sent out to kill replicants? And Villeneuve just takes that and says, "Yep, there's the premise of my film." Right. He goes, "Yes, you're you're right. That is interesting. <laughs> Let's do that. Let's do that." And thing. by putting it out in the open, you don't have to be coy about it. We can just openly discuss whether or not. You know, and that's, again, that's not a slight on the original. You know, that's to say that there's, there's, if we're gonna do these types of things again, let's do them in a way that's fresh. And the question about K is not, is he a replicant, but is he born? So they just completely flipped the, the mystery about the protagonist. Yeah, it's a different story, which, you know, as I said earlier, I really appreciate that the film uh, went out of its way to do that. And one of the things that, so, you know, one thing about Kay that I really am interested in, and I don't really know if this is actually going to lead somewhere. So so the, the slide has a picture of that the toy horse, and it actually turns out, I actually, I believe that the horse is a unicorn. And so I actually have the little model here. If you look at the head, there's a hole on mm -hmm. the head where a horn would be. It's like, yeah, this is this is mind blowing when I first saw it. Um, and there is, but there's no horn on the actual toy unicorn. It's not clear if it was never inserted, if it broke off, whatnot. And now, as we know from the first movie, especially from, from the director's cut and the final cut, the the image of a unicorn is heavily associated with, with Deckard. And mm. especially with Ridley Scott's questioning of whether or not Deckard is a replicant, and Ridley Scott, for the record, says he is a replicant. Uh, it's also, mm. at the end of the movie, Gaff makes that little origami of a mm. unicorn. And you know, it's, I've always interpreted that as a, suggesting that Deckard's, Deckard thinking that he's going to just run away with Rachel is a bit of a fantasy. So, you know, it's just it's very interesting that this this toy unicorn that that Kay has this memory of an animal associated with Deckard, and we I think we're led to believe that Deckard actually made this toy horse unicorn for his daughter. But the fact that Kay has this the memory is just really interesting too. It's almost as if he has a connection with Deckard 
but it's a broken connection or it's an incomplete connection. I'm not even really sure where I'm going with this, but, you know. Yeah, and well, I mean, and I think there's a lot of ways we could go with it. Like, you know, it occurs to me that unicorns are, you know, a, a kind of synonym for a very rare and special thing. And and in a way, that's all the animals in this world, you know, and, and so the unicorn kind of is, it could be a symbol of a lot of things, but also it's, if it's a unicorn, it's one that has no horn and so looks like any other horse. So kind of by definition, it looks like all the others and is kind of mundane and, and not necessarily something magical and special. Um, so yeah, and I mean, I think like at the end of the day, if a lot of these um, sci-fi and transhumanist stories are about memories and that's the thing that a lot of stories conclude kind of gives us our humanity, then I think Kay does have a connection with Deckard, even if he wasn't the, the one to physically embody the memory. Um, he has the memory and that has to have some sort of effect on you. Um, and I think it does. And, you know, so I think like, yeah, there is a, a real tangible connection with Deckard through the, the, the horse, but that's really interesting that it has an actual little hole in the model. That's fascinating. Deckard even asks Kay, you know, what am I to you? And doesn't get an answer. If you want to hide a unicorn, what's the easiest thing to do? Right. Cut off its horn, make it look like a horse. Right. So, you know, this is the idea that they're hiding a unicorn, um, whether it's Kay or, or, or someone else, which mm -hmm. it's not Kay. But he thinks it is. Yeah, and David is, is pointing out similar questions of humanity and reproduction and what it means to be alive to Battlestar Galactica, like for sure, like when you hear, I mean, that's K is the Hera or or not K, it's Anna in the end, but K thinks of himself as the Hera of this world of, and again, there's that subversion of, okay, we could have done the story where instead of having you know, a human who wonders if he's replicant. We could have had a replicant who wonders if he's human, but no, like it's something in between. Like there's this kind of third way, this middle ground where it's replicant, but a replicant born. And that creates something new, you know, the, the more human than human idea. So it's mm -hmm. not even him questioning whether or not he's a human character at all, but this, other category of being. Speaking of the various women in the movie, here's a slide with some of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry, go ahead, Chris. It looked like you were about No, to I just, something. I thought it was wonderful how many different strong women there are, but in our prep for this, Dom mentioned that there's some um, controversy about some of the ways that women are depicted and I was interested to hear more about that. Yeah, so I, I don't agree with this view, obviously, but um, you know, I, I, there was some controversy. There's some of the some reviews um, argued that most, if not all the women in, in the film were um, in uh, positions of servitude or sometimes essentially slavery. Um, they were oppressed. Uh, prostitutes, as in, in the case of Mariette in the upper right corner, you know, Joy is obviously, um, you know, fake or a slave. Love is um, in a very oppressive work environment. Lieutenant Joshi, uh, well, Anna Staleen is basically living in a bubble, so she's in a cage, quote unquote. Um, and I don't, I don't know how much they address Joshi, but I. You know, so I think that their concern is that this was showing a future in which women are, you know, not actually equal to men. And then you get to the the statues in Las Vegas, uh, the giant um, uh, women posing suggestively, the, the giant hologram of Joyce suge posing suggestively. Um, so I, I, I'm probably not doing justice to, to their argument. Go look up 
I'm sure you can find it online if you if you want more details. Um, my my response though is that, um, and it, well, so Denny, I should say first, Denny Villeneuve was asked about this in an interview, and he said, "Well, Blade Runner 2049 isn't actually about the future; it's about the present, and it's about society and the present. And the present and women are just are generally are often not treated well in our society. And I think that's kind of what I would say. I, I would agree with that response, and that." If this is the film is an exploration of identity and what it means to be human and in and society and unfortunately part of the human experience is that we don't have gender equality. Um and I would just also point out that um even though this film has a lot of statues of women posing suggestively and even has a very weird uh menage a trois sex scene, like it's not titillating. You know, it's not it's not sex for the purpose of turning on its male viewership. It's part of the story. And oftentimes I felt uh, almost off-putting in how commercialized and base sex is treated and just how, how exploited the, just how exploitative those, those female holograms and statues are. Like it's not, so I think it's, you know, if anything, it, it, I think it's maybe just the 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 it, it is a type of horror with it, like the horror the, of exploiting humans in that in that in that way. Um, so, yeah. So, I, I, anyways, I, I again, I probably, probably didn't do justice to, to the debate. The debate, but there is a debate out there about this. Sure. Yeah. Um, just real quick, it looks like uh, in my extensive uh, research on Wikipedia, um, the two sort of uh, people who make um, sort of the best argument for the misogynistic view um, are Charlotte Gush in a Vice article and Anna Smith in a Guardian article. Um, there may be others, but those are at least uh, the two that seem to be the most uh, um, the, the most cited uh, versions of that. Um, argument um and i can I, actually we can add that to the web page for the um for this episode uh or this panel or whatever um on the MythGuard site so that people can link right to them yeah and i mean without presenting the arguments fully maybe we're kind of knocking over straw men um but like initially kind of when if if one of the charges is is women are treated a certain way and that implies that they're treated the same way um whereas when i kind of look at this uh array of images um i don't necessarily see that you know i think we have uh marietta and joy who are in those position as kind of you know sex workers within the world um and you know there's um aspects of that slavery and subservience um to love as well um but i mean i think joshi is if she's not mentioned in the arguments then that's a significant omission um because there's somebody who's not really sexualized at all and in a position of authority um and you know and i think anna even though she's in that kind of bubble again like dom said it's it's for very specific story reasons um and i don't get her Kind of objectified in the same way. I think she's treated pretty sensitively. Um, and he, I think Joy and um, Marietta are, are treated pretty sensitively as well. I don't necessarily even feel that their portrayals are um, not nuanced or are problematic. Um, so that's and, my gut reaction. I don't know how Chris feels. And Fraser is the head of the rebellion, and that's a right, sure. that's a woman. So we've got Joshi and Fraser as two really strong women that are the the leaders of whatever unit you know they're with and the actual chosen one is not you know a cisgender white male this time so there is that and i think that the um aspects of of violence and oppression extend to a lot of the male characters as well like that's not unique to the women i mean maybe the um the sex work aspect seems to be from from what we see but um but certainly Kay 
is oppressed and you know in, in you know in his world and Deckard is kind of living this life of exile on the run it's certainly not a life of luxury for him either um you know so i think even i don't know that those issues that are brought up are necessarily gender specific Sapper i think Morgan. there's also just an underlying question of what we want from our science fiction and i think we're having a real uh uh discussion or at least angry arguments on Twitter about this right now. Like, do we want, um, you know, there, there are other gender-based angry arguments on Twitter where we're, we're not going there, but, um, yeah, but do, we, do we want science fiction depictions of the future that are aspirational mm -hmm. or do we want something that reflects the issues that we face today? Um, and there are certain ways of going about representation that are more about showing empowerment like captain marvel and black panther are two recent examples maybe not quite science fiction but um those are examples of showing um uh women or p persons of color and powerful roles and but i think denny bill news approach is just to say this is the world is tough and this is like it's not easy, and the, the the whole film, not just not just the gender roles, but you know, much of this film is brutal. It's harsh. Um, the the type of architecture that they used in the, the movie is called brutal brutalist architecture, and they're you know, it's it's supposed to be oppressive. So I think I think the the depiction of gender is supposed to be part of that. Right, and sure. it's a little, I mean, you're making a sequel to Blade Runner, so um, we know that Villeneuve likes to zag, but also, like, you are actually wanting to engage with the world that was set, like, there, there's a certain expectation that this is not a nice world, um, and so there's, you know, and I think, like, what you were saying earlier, that when it does handle the sex and the violence, it does it pretty tastefully, it doesn't feel, um, he doesn't really linger on female bodies too long or in ways that are um you know exploitative necessarily um yeah even like when you get those big statues and everything like you don't really get a full shot of them it's like you'll see like a limb or a corner of things you kind of have to piece it together um and actually i don't know if he's said this or not i i wonder if they're um a reference to a clockwork orange there's some like the poses um mm. seem like when you know that movie starts and they're in the the milk bar or whatever um and like that definitely did linger on things for the shock value um in a way that this movie doesn't but i think it's drawing on that same idea of this is supposed to remind you of other dystopias you've seen and worlds where women are you know subservient and objectified and we're drawing on those traditions to address that. Sure. And, uh, you know, and in terms of oppression and, you know, all of the things that we've been talking about, I mean, you know, you can, you definitely can go beyond just gender and um, even class, like, you know, between like replicant and human to you know the orphanage like child labor and slave mm -hmm. you know child slavery basically um and and even um you know race issues there of like you know yes uh, what what's his name morton or who's the sapper morton yeah um you know the, 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 the maggot farmer guy yeah well anyway so like just the idea of that like there are many different types of oppression, you know, being portrayed here. It it doesn't mean that like we're saying that, you know, or or that Vinueva is saying is, you know, these are good in any kind of way. It's, you know, kind of I think I think what Don is trying to say is that it's an extrapolation. And to Kat's point, like you can you can zig and zag, but like only so much. Like within the world and the context, it still has to be believable and extrapolatable you know from where we've already been to a certain extent which i think, I think works well for I think everybody in this movie is in some sort of 
confined situation. They can't mm -hmm. be themselves or, you know, you've got Gaff, Edward James almost, he's at a old folks home, he can't leave. Um, you've got yeah. the, the replicants um, or the angels, he calls them now. Um, we haven't talked a lot about Neander Wallace, Jared mm -hmm. Leto, um, mm -hmm. but he definitely owns and, and controls and murders with impunity, male and female angels without, you know, regard to gender, especially in the prologue um, movie. Um, I think Nexus Dawn, yeah. the first new model is a, is a very pretty boy toy kind of um, angel. Um, Sapper Morton is in kind of a prison. He's got to hide out on this maggot farm. And when he, um, you know, he doesn't really have anywhere to go. And uh, Mr. Cotton, you know, the orphanage head is um, in a prison. And, you know, it's just, it's a very confining movie. Everybody's confined. It's not just women. Although the women are sexualized to an extent that the men aren't. Sure. Cotton is a very conspicuous name too in in that tradition of you know slavery, slavery and, yeah. and everything. You yeah. Know? Um, you know, I was almost going to raise the issue of race in this film, um, but I wasn't really sure what I had to say out in it um, and how because it's. When I even even the first time I saw this movie, I was I was actually struck by the lack of not not that there are no non-white actors, but it's actually you know and you know I don't there are there are probably production reasons as to why many of the actors and background characters are white. This movie was filmed in Hungary, which is not the most ethnically diverse country in the world. So, but putting putting aside production reasons. Um, it still strikes me as something about this movie, and there have been some criticisms of the film that I actually think go way too far, suggesting that, oh, this is just another example of science fiction being unable to imagine people of color in the future, and, you know, and, or, or that people of color are only in positions of being oppressed or criminals, and I don't know if I'd go that far, but at the same time, I, I do wonder, and I've not heard Bill New talk about this at all in interviews, I do wonder if this is again him saying that this is a reflection of reality and reality is not pretty. You know, I live in Washington, D.C., and, you know, it is, it's an unfortunate fact of life where, you know, unfortunately, there are definitely, you know, racial disparities, um, economic, career, um, you know, and you can see it every day, and it's it's you know, so maybe maybe this is just the film being honest in a way that's not pretty. Hmm. But then, if so, are you? What's the if if the what's the ugly truth that the film is pointing out? If if it's a deliberate decision to keep the that's cast a, mostly yeah. white. Um, I don't. Well, I'm not. I'm not sure what. I don't know if it was, but like the fact yeah. that the the two most prominent non-white characters, Mr. Cotton and uh, the dealer who who analyzes the wood, I forget his name. That the fact that they're marginal characters, that they are kind of you know shifty traders or engaging in illegal activity. Like the fact that that is how our society views these types mm. of people. And uh, they're often pushed to the margins, you know, or excluded from places like, you know, the halls of power in the under Wallace Corporation. Like, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of speculating. And I have, again, I have not heard Bill New talk about this at all. So I don't know what his approach was. Right. It's hard to say to what extent that was an intentional choice. And even if it was, again, intentions only go so far. Like, we can still draw our own conclusions about what it implies about the world and the effectiveness of any of that. Um, but I agree. I noticed watching this, this is a surprisingly white movie. Um, and in a way that feels even, even two years after it came out feels slightly dated like that. I feel like if this were coming out this year or next year, I would expect a different makeup of cast in a way. Um, so 
you know, or I mean, maybe he did it for intentional reasons. I'm not sure. Well, he's got some more stuff in the pipeline, so I guess we'll have to wait and see what uh, what he does with those. Mm -hmm. And, I, and yeah. I don't want to sound flippant because these are very serious issues, but, you know, we always jump to the negative conclusion. And it also could be that a lot of the minorities got off the planet and, and there were just, you know, stupid white people left or, or defective white people left. I mean, sure. And you could you could answer this question in a lot of a lot of ways and not necessarily go negative. Sure. So yeah, I set up this slide <laughs> um, about the eyes because, yeah. hey, there were a lot of eyes in the first movie and there's still a lot of eyes, especially after having our discussion and watching it really closely through the first one. When I went to watch this one, I immediately was like, okay, I'm gonna start like writing down all the different eyes that come up in this movie. Um, not sure that we'll have anything new to conclude necessarily. Um, you know, I, I'm open to hearing ideas of what you think this is trying to convey. Um, but I am struck by the green eyes of the opening, the one on the left, um, and the fact that we, st we yet again, it opens with an eye that we do not know whose eye it is. Um, so there's another kind of moment of typology there. Um, and uh, the green of the eye jumped out to me um, from uh, the tradition of, you know, the, the green-eyed Beatrice, this kind of moment of apotheosis and, and the, you know, the window to the soul and everything. And, and we get um, Deckard's line later in the movie that Rachel's green eyes are the thing that tips him off, that the clone of Rachel isn't genuine. It's just a fake. Her eyes were green. Um, so I felt like that was definitely a thing we should point out. Um, and throughout, you know, we get, here's where we can talk about Jared Leto, you know, you get his milky white blind eyes and then you get people with various kinds of glasses and lenses on and um, all sorts of weird eyes throughout this movie. And the replicants yeah. are now marked in their eyeballs. Right, mm -hmm. right, yeah, that's the, the, the are, serial numbers there. If the eyes are a window to the soul, I think the fact that replicants have a serial number right there is really interesting in a movie where the the central the the MacGuffin per se is like does is the soul does K have a soul and um, you know having a serial number right there kind of seems to suggest that it would just emphasize the fact that no this is well this is a manufactured product it is not it is not something that we think has a soul and just going to the right of that picture Joy the hologram of Joy has Black Dow eyes, and she uh, the, the hologram otherwise looks just like the character, the actress, except for the eyes. They're blacked out, which again, mm -hmm. you know, is kind of maybe suggesting that you know she, she she maybe that there isn't a soul underneath that programming. Um, and Jared right, Leto uh, too. Doesn't Marietta <laughs> say that she, you, you, there's not as much in yeah, there? Yeah, I've been inside you, and there's not much yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and Jared Leto's, the fact that his eyes are closed, that you can't see into them, it's just for, for such a mysterious character who's, you know, whose thoughts and motives are very difficult to understand is just very, is, is very appropriate too. Um, yeah, in, in terms of Replicants having a soul, uh, whether we believe this or not, at least um, one of the prologues, right? I think makes that explicit of uh, like there's no there's no heaven for us or for our kind or something like that. Isn't that what the, the is it the father saying to the daughter or, or whatever the relationship is there to the younger? It's in like the animated one. Trying to I, I can't remember the yeah. order or even what the yeah, names. It's, are. The, it's the first prologue. one. It's Blade Runner twenty twenty two. I only watched them each once, but uh, I just remember that being that line. Like, yeah, this the idea of like th this is uh, this is our existence, whatever we have here on Earth. Um, and of course, I mean, given your belief 
system or lack of belief system, um, you know, there's certainly that question for humans too. I mean, I don't think it has to be only a replicant question per se, but um, just to point out that at least, at least for some of the replicants, like that seems to be an explicitly stated thing, but like they maybe part of the reason part part of the thing that separates them from humans isn't just like their level of intelligence or free will or program you know programming or whatever but it's also like this nebulous idea of a soul um which of course i mean there was observation made earlier of links to battlestar galactica that certainly comes up in in that show as well mm -hmm. um you know what what if any you know, after light do humans have and, and do those made in the likeness of humans have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the, the serial number on the eye reminds me of when Deckard asks Kay's name and, you know, K-37, whatever his, and he says, that's, that's not a name, that's a serial number and you yeah. know, give me your proper name. So this, this idea of, your I and the I of identity, like I myself, what I think I am and, and how I identify and your name, um, all being sort of interlinked, interlinked within self. <laughs> well, I just had an idea, you know, the same way that the way to hide a unicorn is to disguise it as a horse, break off its horn. Um, what if Meander Wallace is a replicant and he's hiding <laughs> the barcode in his eyes by having blind. Mm. Ah, David. David, David just asked, "Is there a reason? Is there an obvious character reason to make uh, Jared Leto's character blind?" Right. That could be you know, one potential, two, one the potential two, theory. I, yeah. That are trying I took to. That more. Okay. Oh, sorry, Fraza and. Um, gosh, it might be somebody from the prologue. Take out their right eye so they can't be identified by that mm -hmm. as replicants. Mm -hmm. um, this would be another way of hiding that because I don't know why he's blind, except that mm -hmm. it sets him off differently. So I took Wallace's blindness as just as I was suggesting before, just as, as, as a sort of inscrutability. Um, Neander Wallace, you know, the guy lives in a pyramid, so yeah. Uh, that tells you a lot about him. He he is um, he is the he is a pharaoh mixed with a Silicon Valley tech tycoon. He has done more for humanity than anybody before or since. With the in the, in the beginning of the movie, there's a he's came up with some technology that saved humanity from starvation, and he tells Love that he has this vision of humanity expanding to the stars but he wants he needs a slave race so the human human race can can grow to trillions um there's a line in god uh, i think it's god emperor of dune about leto the god emperor leto the second describing him as the first truly long-term planner in history the first person who can really think about what humanity not what he not what he his company not even what earth needs but what humanity should do in the future what it needs we can argue about whether wallace is right about what humanity needs and i would argue with that but you know, i think wallace has a vision just beyond the scope of what most of us can even think about and he has the power and the resources to execute it um and it just puts him in a very and just in terms of what that does to his humanity that just it's something that is kind of hard to fathom um you know it's hard for us to think of that and i think that's so just like what like what is your life like if you're thinking you know i'm gonna build a slave race so humanity can survive and thrive it's just it's you know so i don't know i, just, I find him to be a fascinating character but also one that i think is really difficult to understand if he was a replicant he'd be building more replicants so the replicants can take over because he wants millions of them and he's in pursuit of of the the, fer the fertile replicant rachel so they can have uh, replicant babies i like that theory hmm. 
Right. And, and unfathomable because he's thinking on a different scale maybe than what anybody else is, but also like connecting back to the kind of empty eyed joy hologram over there. Um, maybe less inside, like empty inside, like if the eyes are the window to the soul, like you can't, he's unfathomable we, we can't really see inside him or understand what makes him work but then does that make him kind of empty in a way and i think we see um a lack of empathy and all the other things that the replicants are you know kind of supposed to be able to keep in check um he like would fail those tests um you know in terms of how he treats his creation and and you know the the women that he makes and everything so i don't know like he's he's pretty disturbing um to me like i don't know i mean maybe there's a there's an aspect in which we're supposed to find it sort of admirable just because they're you know he he did something to save the world um but also i think that emptiness is supposed to be quite frightening too Yeah, and so to what extent does one his his to what extent does his blindness enable his vision, so to speak? Um, you know, in order like, is there a sense in which like just not being distracted by seeing the way the world is around him, you know, allow him to kind of have ideas and goals that go beyond what the average person would think because they can see what's around them and maybe are distracted by closer, you know, opportunities and, you know, ideas. Um, and to what extent is, is maybe, you know, some of what he's trying to accomplish, you know, an aspect of his being blind, like, it's kind of two sides of the same coin in a way. Like, like there's the enabling factor by sort of removing distractions, but then there's also the, like, by not having those distractions, he just, he doesn't have like the same typical motivations of the normal, normal average person, whatever you want to call it. And, and so like, maybe there's, maybe there's all, it's also a compensation of just like, well, I'm just going to do this, other thing than that no one else would ever do or think of. I don't, it, I, I agree with Tom, like it is really hard to kind of get in there. So I don't even know if those are, if it's possible to answer those questions, but. Well, if just, you read books about like really, you know, quote unquote, really successful people and how they operate, one of the things that some of them will recommend is that you cut down distractions. So like I've even heard like some suggestion, like you basically just like limit your wardrobe limit the amount of decisions yeah. you have to make only one like one suit or like you know right. one, like one change of clothes kind of yeah yeah keep the distractions out of your mind and yeah, so i think and i think that kind of goes to cat's point where i think like like i agree like like replicants he's missing crucial aspects of what we would deem to be quote unquote human but i think i think he's missing them in a different way there's a different there's a different uh error of lack of empathy, so to speak. The, the replicants would have trouble identifying with the specific um, as the other, as, as as part of themselves, especially when it comes to animals and the void comp test um, in the first movie. I think Neander Wallace is just, he's above that. And I don't mean that in a good way, but his, he's just, he's focused on the, the macro picture of the macro level um he doesn't like he 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 is you know so i i just i don't think he i don't think his mind would want to focus on the details he'd view them as distractions um uh, and there's been some interesting speculation as to why um wallace would go through all this trouble of uh creating a replicant version of rachel and then get the eye color wrong and mm -hmm. You know, it seems like for somebody who has so many resources at his disposal, 
that would have been something easy to catch. But it's also possible that he is just so focused on the on the big picture that he missed a detail like that, a detail mm-hmm. that somebody who is in love with another human being would pr- like probably know that like you probably know your lover's eye color. So, um, and he also I don't know if he notices love crying when he kills the replicant um, or some of love's internal conflict. I I could imagine that he's just unaware of that as well. I read something that the original Rachel's eyes were actually brown, and that Decker yeah, they're was brown. Long. But in the boy when he does the boy comp test, her eye, the eye shown in the test is green. So okay, um, mm-hmm. it's un, it's a bit Bond, unclear. Bond are brown or it's weird. It, it's a bit unclear if it's a bit unclear which one was the error in terms of the story continuity, at least because. Obviously, they can't both be true. Or they're hazel, and it depends on the light. Right, yeah. It depends on what color people are. So, yeah, and kind of as you were talking, Dom, I I was thinking, like, it brings up an interesting question of, okay, like, if, if... if if we're going with the Steve Jobs Steve Jobs thing, right, of like always wearing the same black turtleneck, you know, every day to limit your choices, um, does that mean that Wallace like blinded himself? Like, do we do we know why he's blind? Do we get an explanation for his blindness? We don't. But this is a man who ordered a replicant to kill himself for the purposes of a product demonstration. So I could believe that he just blinded himself. Yeah. Like, I yeah. think that's a legitimate yeah, I think that's question. A possibility. Yeah. <laughs> um, did he do this intentionally to give himself a certain focus or even just to see if he could, because it would prove something to himself that then he'd be capable of anything, which he then is. Uh, just a, just a thought. There's well, no way to like gonna, prove that, I think, but and I feel like the the blindness as sort of either symbolic or even enabling of these kind of nearly superhuman kind of powers, I think makes more sense if you treat it as a choice that he made rather than just a symptom of like, you know, a disability. Like he was born this way. Like, well, plenty of people are blind and they're not like, you know, psychopaths. Um, whereas sure. like I, if, 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 you know, the link to the link between the blindness and the way he is, which there does seem to be a link suggests that there's something intentional about it. Um, which I, so I would kind of tend to guess that, yes, like uh, that was definitely a thought as I was watching it was to wonder about how and why he's blind in the first place. I've never really thought about this that much, but you know, I, I almost wonder if um, it, it's less about. It, I, I agree that there does seem to be some intentionality behind it, but I wonder if it's less about like him splashing acid on his eyes and more about and what would be very fitting with his personality if he looked at something that he wasn't supposed to and survived, but the cost was his eyes. So like. You know, if he was the type of person who believed in, had so much confidence that he looked into the, like, looked into the center of an atomic blast or something like that. Um, and so he is, and so he, he caused the blindness in himself, but it's rooted in, in that, that fatal flaw of hubris or ego. Um, that he, that his confidence that no matter what obstacle, he's just going to plow through it. Kind of an Oedipal connection, um, like the eyes as consequence for something, whatever that might be, which I think is different sure. from like whereas, whereas when I think of um, is it Freza who uh, is the leader of the replicant rebel army and her kind of hollowed out right eye, which she's removed, you know, to to not be identified. I think more of like Odin, like. Her her removing of the eye is like a symbol of wisdom or something. Like like I'm doing this to ascend to something higher and greater and to gain something that I can't have without it. 
Um, whereas like potentially Wallace could be as consequence for something um, that he either did or saw that maybe was something he shouldn't have. Sure. And if we're gonna, so if we're going like old, like classical mythology here too, like, I mean, there's also Tiresias, right? Where you have this idea of like, he he loses his sight, but then gains foresight and prophecy, right? And so right. He's, he's that's, yeah. but that's a, even that's like different, right? Like if we're, if we go that route, then there's a different take here too, because that's like, okay, well he, you know, he's struck blind, Tiresias is struck blind by the gods, but kind of, there's this like after effect of like, okay, well, but now he has these like prophet prophetical capabilities, you know, here it's like, no, I'm going to like blind myself so that I can like keep my vision, you know, my, my metaphorical vision of, you know, accomplishing this great thing for humanity or right, like what he it, believes is a great thing for humanity. So there's, there's obviously a different sort of motivating factor there, but, you know, I think there's there's also kind of a parallel. Right. Is it if if he was struck blind at some point for some reason, is it a is it a gift or a punishment? You know, for whatever or happened, and, and and we don't you know, know. Yeah. To achieve a particular goal. Yeah. Right. Is he's alive at the end of the movie, right? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. So there's there's a uh, I don't know if they'll do a a sequel if this did that bad at the box office, but, mm. um, you know, that could be a, a potential. First one did bad at the box office too, though. <laughs> did it really? Wow. Well, it's um, interesting too that Neander Wallace, who presumably has all the money in the world and all the technology in the world, doesn't choose to replace his eyes with normal artificial mm -hmm. eyes. He uses these robots and, or, Droid drones or whatever, and um, you know, I I don't know like what spectrum of light you can see with those those barracudas, but it, it, one thing like he has several of them, so he can presumably have a wider field of vision and see multiple things at once, which is again just very very much in keeping with his character, like the the one who is blind but can see all. Mm -hmm. So we did have some eye stuff to talk about, Kat. Good call. Good. I'm glad. Um, we're kind of coming up on the last few minutes here. Um, I know we brought up um, even just recently, you know, the potential for a sequel um, or whether or not there is potential. Um, Dom, you discovered today uh, just this um, Blade Runner comic series um, announcement. I, I don't, I didn't read the article, so I don't know if you have anything to say about it or. There's not much there. to say. It's, it's just an announcement with um, uh, an image and there's a, I think it takes place in 2019 um, or shortly after the first film, the there's a replicant hunter whose name is Ash. And that's the woman who is depicted in this, that center image. Um, the shadow behind her is Rachel's shadow. Mm -hmm. It's not her shadow. It's not Ash's shadow. Mm -hmm. um, so there's some speculation in this article that she might be hunting Rachel or that there might be some connection there. That's really all we know. And it's obviously set in the same continuity as the movies. It's gonna you know, fit in with the movies somehow. And if Rachel is involved, it's probably gonna have, tell us something about her, maybe the circumstances under which she gave birth or died. Um, but that's really all we know. Nothing so far as I know announced set after 2049. Right. Um, you know, not yet, although we know that, as you said, the first movie wasn't necessarily the most successful. It, it caught on over time in the culture and by word of mouth and everything. So, um, you know, I do wonder, I don't think certainly no more Blade Runner sequels are imminent, but um, you never know, like with reboot fever and, and if things catch on over time, if this, if this movie continues to be 
seen and discussed and people find it interesting, I could see somewhere along the line that somebody comes along and decides to pick it up again. Let's all meet back here in 30 years. Yeah. Sure. Uh, and I'm sure we'll have some stuff to talk about. I mean, apparently both Hampton Fancher, the scriptwriter, and and Ridley Scott have indicated their willingness to do another one if the right story can be figured out. Um, and even Harrison Ford has apparently said he would, uh, similarly, if the story is right, he would be willing to perhaps uh, do something else. Now, what that would look like if at this point, you know, would that be like flashbacks or you know, however, if we're jumping another 30 years in the future, is it realistic to have Deckard still around? You know, I don't know. Um, but then again, if he's a replicant, then sure, why not, right? Um, um, here's here's a question we haven't discussed. Um, and I, th I suspect it's one of those, this is deliberately unanswerable. What, where do you come down on the, is, the, is K dead uh, question? Um, I'm gonna kind of, cheat a bit because I guess for me the, the, the first question is do we want a sequel or do we want answers to these questions it seems to me is K dead what happens with Neander Wallace's plans for humanity and does Fraser does this replicant revolution ever take take foot and does it ever become does it do, do replicants gain their rights and you know, I was skeptical of Blade Runner 2049 going into it I just thought the original was such a great movie why mess with it I love Blade Runner 2049 now, so I'm a convert. But at the same time, I still do wonder, you know, you know, are we, you know, how far can we push the story before we, you know, tread into less interesting territory? Because with all these potential plot ho plot hooks, I think one of the things that makes this movie so fascinating too is it actually, in other ways, it opens more. It, it raises more questions than it answers. It doesn't answer the question, is Deckard a replicant? It doesn't mm -hmm. tell us exactly what happened to Deckard and Rachel all those years. Um, you know, we get hints of what happened, but like there are more questions that it opens. And I kind of feel like with the Blade Runner universe, that's really important. We want to have that room for speculation. And ultimately these are movies about intellectual, discovery about humanity about identity identity about the big questions of life they're not really movies about i don't think they're movies at least about plot like plot mm -hmm. twists and what happens to this or that so i don't know i just i don't know if i want a sequel maybe i'm just old and stodgy and nostalgic or whatever but i don't know i don't you know, maybe in 30 years i'll change my mind you don't want like well, Terminator 5, way. pirates of the caribbean 6 or 27 um, I mean, I think that it's always with the caveat that if we, we want a good sequel, right? Like right. It, we want it if it's worth doing. And I think that's just always the question is, is it, is it worth doing? Do they have a, a story to justify it? Um, yeah, and I agree. I mean, I, and Dom and I kind of chatted about this very briefly on Twitter, although we didn't really get into it, but the, the question of unanswered questions and stories and, um, like I would definitely come down on in favor of that as a technique in that it, the fact that this opens up the world to larger questions and leaves you not unsatisfied in a bad way, but unsatisfied in wanting more. There's something satisfying about the non-satisfaction of that um, <laughs> in a very like C.S. Lewis kind of way. Like, like the fact that I want to know more is, that's what's compelling about it. Um, so I would, if if there is a sequel, I would want it to give me that same feeling again. Um, and yeah, every question you answer should spring up ten new ones um, and and kind of expand it out from there. I, I mean, so I'm just going to go ahead and and give my answer to the question, which is um, a non-answer because, well, kind of a non-answer. I. Kat and I joke all the time in our podcast that like, unless you see the death on screen, it it didn't happen. And even sometimes when you do see the death on screen, it still didn't happen. <laughs> like, right, so, especially like, when it, they're when, when they're replicants. Yeah, sci-fi <laughs> and replicants, and yeah, you know, 
I I would be if there is to be a sequel, I would be surprised if we didn't see Ryan Gosling again. Um, whether it's K or the same K as here, I mean, maybe that's going to be the next question of is it the same K or did the other the the did the original K die and is this a new K? Like I could see that being a question of a sequel, but you know, I we didn't see him explicitly die. Yes, he was very hurt and there was sad music and rain and all of that. And you can read whatever symbolism you want to read into various things, but. Well, and I think it's, I, I this isn't, I don't mean this in like a cynical, like Hollywood franchise kind of way, but I think uh, this is my crit fic. I suspect that they genuinely didn't know and so left themselves options. And like that doesn't necessarily make it a bad way of going about things. I don't, I, I don't necessarily see that as a bad thing, but I could see that the fact that you could interpret Kay's ending in multiple ways is leaving a little bit of the door ajar for to see how this movie did and what the response to it was. Well, Kat, I'm going to re- I'm going to restore your faith in humanity a little bit because the screen one of the screenwriters for the the uh, script uh, said that he was surprised anybody thought Kay did not die. Hmm. So. His intention, again, we don't have to be bound by his intention, but his intention mm-hmm. was that Kay died. Hmm. Interesting. That's so, certainly what I took away from it as well. Now, now, in terms of the replicant uprising, I predict that the sequel is going to be um, the the Blade Runner equivalent of the first, you know, half hour of Saving Private Ryan. It's just going to be like oh. replicant war. You know, all battle, no substance. No, I'm just kidding. I That's what I'm that. worried about is that they'll just go for the action, <laughs> yeah. and not the story. Um, I would be very so if we have the same, you know, participants in writing and producing and directing. I would be very surprised that that, that were the case. But that's the trap of the sequel. It's this is a plot thread. How do you resolve it? But for a either showing them that war or b just having a text. Um, prologue at the beginning saying this there was war happened, a war. and now we have yeah. a new status quo. Right. Um, neither of which is all that satisfying. Yeah. I don't know. Well, anyway, we know at least uh, for Denis that he's doing something different for the moment. Um, for the next quite a few moments, in fact. Um, and that's on to one of our uh, other favorite topics of Dune, which I'm sure we will be covering in a future movie club. Uh, we are now past our uh, 10.30 mark, so we should probably let folks go. But uh, yeah, thank you all for joining us. And we hope to see you back soon for uh, the, the the next movie club. Again, is in April for Captive State. Um, and if you missed that one, then be sure to come watch uh, our conversation with Corey and Chris on Camelot. Oh, that was alliterative. I didn't even mean to make it that <laughs> way. So um, anyway, thank you all. Have a great uh, rest of your evening, and we'll see you back here in about a month. Happy Pi Day. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, guys. See ya.